Welcome to the fifth Sunday of Advent and we find ourselves in the season and a series looking at famous last words. Not just any famous last words but Jesus's famous last words. The seven last words or phrases that Jesus utters from the cross and even though we're calling them last words actually we're seeing that the end is the beginning. Now, if you listen to the podcast earlier this week uh, you'll know that this week's focus is about distress. And our reading is taken from John 19, verse 28, and it is simply this, I am thirsty. Now, after last week, where we looked at Jesus's fourth word from the cross with this big, dramatic and dark sense, this heavy kind of foreboding feeling of abandonment, this next word that we get to seems pretty ordinary, really. I'm thirsty. It's something that I'm sure we've all said. You may have even said it today. It's something that we've all felt before. I am thirsty. Now, I'm sure we're seeing Jesus's humanity here from this picture on the cross. Just think about the sheer amount of time that he has been awake at this point. He didn't sleep on the Thursday evening as he prayed in Gethsemane. And now we're right the way through into Friday. Just think about the hot and dry and arid and dusty climate that this scene is actually taking place in. Just think about all of the trials and the suffering and the torture and the abuse that Jesus has been put through. Of course he's thirsty. Now, he's also drawing upon his Jewish roots here as well and using the Psalms again. In fact, using the same Psalm as we saw last week, Psalm 22. That little section that said, my mouth is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. You see, this fifth word, I am thirsty, is way more than just a statement about a physical need. It isn't just that shallow. It had a deeper level to it as well. See, after experiencing abandonment, like we looked at last time, Jesus is thirsty for the living water of God's presence. Now, we need to remember as we read and think about the passion story, about this crucifixion part of the Gospels, this whole scene to the onlookers would have probably looked like something that was being done to Jesus. And as we read and hear the words, it, it could feel even today as we read them and think about them, like this is something that is being done to Jesus. But this is all actually something that Jesus chose to do. Something that Jesus allowed to happen to himself. You see, six hours before this fifth word, just as Jesus is going to be nailed to the cross, Jesus is offered a drink of wine mixed with myrrh, we're told, which he refuses. This drink wasn't to quench that thirst that he now talks about on the cross. This drink was a mild painkiller and a sedative. This drink would have lessened the pain and the agony that Jesus was about to experience on the cross. Now, personally, I don't know about you, but I only have to start to feel a headache coming on and I, or a slight bit of pain somewhere and I go straight to our medicine cabinet and I grab the paracetamol. If we were offered this kind of drink, if we were offered this kind of pain-killing, numbing, sedative, kind of almost get-out clause, most of us would have taken it. But we're told that Jesus refused it. Why? Because Jesus was ready and willing to fully experience the pain that was coming his way. But now, six hours after that first offer of a drink, we read this. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on the stalk of a hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. Now, the mention of the hyssop plant here might seem a little bit like a throwaway detail. Like, why is the Bible telling us this? What? Who cares? Why does it matter that it was a hyssop plant? 
But this mention of the hyssop, this tall flowering herb, would set any Hebrew spidey senses tingling. This was a big hyperlink back to something else that had already happened in Israelite history. You see, back in the Exodus story, where the Israelites are freed from slavery in Egypt, the Hebrew slaves used those stalks of hyssop to paint the lamb's blood across their door frames of their homes to indicate that they should be passed over during that tenth and final plague. And now here is Jesus, the lamb of God, the perfect Passover lamb at Passover as well. And we have his blood shed and his life sacrificed to free everyone from slavery, of sin and death. And here, we're right in the centre of this story, is the hyssop. Also, the hyssop was used by the priests to um, splatter blood as a sign of purification for a diseased person or an infected home. And now again, here is Jesus, our great high priest, offering his own blood to make us pure and in right relationship with God, making us healed and whole. And also in the Psalms, David writes this, cleanse me with the hyssop and I will be clean. So this detail of the hyssop and this fifth word, I am thirsty, is way more than just a coincidence of a plant that just, for some reason, just happened to be there at the time. And a, a throwaway line about Jesus having a dry mouth. See, this gives us all hope that God will quench our thirst in the times of need that we have in our lives today. As I've already said, we all know what it's like to be thirsty for a drink of water, physically thirsty. Maybe if you haven't had a drink for a while, or maybe if you've been exercising, or maybe if it's a particularly hot day, then we, we feel that thirst, don't we? But there are other ways that we can thirst as well. Isn't there? What are your troubles today? What are you thirsting for today? Maybe you're thirsty for an illness to finally be over. Maybe you're thirsty for a job. Maybe you're thirsty for a partner. Maybe you're thirsty for a new job. Maybe you're thirsty for an improvement in a relationship. Maybe you're thirsty for respect. Maybe you're thirsty for a purpose or to do something that really matters in the world. Maybe you're thirsty for reconciliation with your children. Maybe you're thirsty for finally getting past that addiction. Maybe you're thirsty for the pain to go away. Whatever it is that you're thirsty for, there are two things that will help you to discover the reason for your distress, which is our theme this week. And they're this, trust and time. Just like how we saw last time when we looked at abandonment, how the dark night of the soul can be a part of our spiritual formation. Being able to endure distress with faith, that is trust over time, helps us to become more like Jesus. Now, we can't talk about thirst without going to that well in Samaria. Um, so we're going to look at John chapter 4. John chapter 4, a well-known story. Jesus realised that the Pharisees were keeping count of the baptisms that he and John performed, although his disciples... Not Jesus did the actual baptising. They had posted the score that Jesus was ahead, turning him and John into rivals in the eyes of the people. So Jesus left the Judean countryside and went back to Galilee. To get there, he had to pass through Samaria. He came to Sychar, a Samaritan village that bordered the field Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was still there. Jesus, worn out by the trip, sat down at the well. It was noon. A woman, a Samaritan, came to draw water. And Jesus said, would you give me a drink of water? His disciples had gone to the village to buy food for lunch. The Samaritan woman, taken aback, asked, how come you, 
a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink. Jews in those days wouldn't be caught dead talking to Samaritans. Jesus answered, if you knew the generosity of God and who I am, you would be asking me for a drink and I would give you fresh living water. The woman said, sir, you don't even have a bucket to draw with and this well is deep. So how are you going to get this living water? Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well and drank from it, he and his sons and his livestock, and who passed it down to us? Jesus said, everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty again and again. Anyone who drinks the water I give will never thirst. Not ever. The water I give will be an artisan spring within, gushing fountains of endless life. The woman said, Sir, give me this water so I won't ever get thirsty, won't ever have to come back to this well again. He said, go and call your husband and then come back. I have no husband, she said. That's nicely put, I have no husband. You've had five husbands and the man you're living with now isn't even your husband. You spoke the truth there, sure enough. Oh, so you're a prophet. Well, tell me this. Our ancestors worshipped God at this mountain. But you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place for worship, right? Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you Samaritans will worship the Father, neither here at this mountain nor there in Jerusalem. You worship guessing in the dark. We Jews worship in the clear light of day. God's way of salvation is made available through the Jews. But the time is coming, it has in fact come, when what you are called will not matter. And where you go to worship will not matter. It's who you are and the way you live that count before God. Your worship must engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth. That's the kind of people the Father is looking out for. Those who simply and honestly themselves before him and in their worship. God is sheer being itself, spirit and those who worship him must do it out of their very being, their spirits, their true selves in adoration. The woman said, I don't know about that. I do know that the Messiah is coming and when he arrives, we'll get the whole story. I am he, said Jesus. You don't have to wait any longer or look any further. Just then his disciples came back and they were shocked. They couldn't believe he was talking with that kind of a woman. No one said what they were all thinking, but their faces showed it. The woman took the hint and left. In her confusion, she left her water pot. Back in the village, she told the people, Come see a man who knew all about the things I did, who knows me inside and out. Do you think this could be the Messiah? And they went out to see for themselves. Going into Samaria, going to a well at midday, speaking to this Samaritan woman. You see, Jesus wasn't scared to break the religious and cultural rules and expectations of that day. All of those things a Jew, a rabbi, a man would never be caught dead doing. And yet Jesus does them all. He says this, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. You see, this woman had no idea who she was sitting next to at that well. And she had no idea who she was talking to. And she had no idea of what he was capable of. She said, sir, you have nothing to draw the water and this well is deep. See, she didn't at first realise something that was true for her then in that story, but something that is true for us here and now today as well. And it's this. When you have Jesus, you already have everything that you need. Jesus didn't need a bucket because Jesus is the source. Jesus didn't need a receptacle to collect the water from that well because Jesus was the source of that living water. You see, this woman had come to a well, but more importantly in that story, she had met a well. Jesus goes on to say, everyone who drinks this living water, uh, this water will be thirsty again, 
but whoever drinks the water I offer will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. It's like Jesus is saying, you've been looking for water in all the wrong places. You've been coming to this well again and again and again. And as we read and hear this story, we need to realise that we are the woman at the well. All the times that we get thirsty and then go looking in the wrong places to satisfy that thirst. God is saying to us all, I am the one. I am the well. I'm the one you've been looking for. I'm the one you've been searching your whole life for and you didn't even know it. I am the one. The prophet Jeremiah talks about trying to drink from wells and cisterns that are broken and cracked. And it got me thinking, how often do I go to the wrong wells for that living water? How often do you go to cracked and faulty wells to quench your thirst? And what are those broken wells that we go to in our lives? Because if we can recognise them, we can avoid going to them in the first place. Maybe your well is a relationship or a particular ideal about a relationship where you knowingly or unknowingly put someone else in the place of God and then you feel confused or disappointed when they let you down. Maybe your well is accomplishment where you think that if you can just achieve that, if you can just produce that, if you can just earn that, then you'll be satisfied. It could be money, your well might be a particular job or to pay off your mortgage or to retire or to go on that dream holiday or get that new car. Whatever your wells are, to quote Angelica Schuyler, you will never be satisfied because Jesus and Jesus alone is the true source of satisfaction. It's why Jesus tells that woman, if you drink from this Samaritan village well, in a few hours, you're going to be thirsty again and you're going to need to come back. But if you drink from me, you will never thirst like that again. So if it's inevitable, if we are going to thirst, whether we like it or not, whether we want to or not, then we may as well thirst for the right thing. Like how the psalmist puts it, you, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. And how the prophet Isaiah says it, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. So even though we are poor, even though we have no way of earning it, Jesus paid the price on the cross. And Jesus offers us the free living water through his grace and through his love. It's been said that when the Roman soldier pierced Jesus' side and that water and blood flowed out, it was so that our thirst could be satisfied. And when God allowed God's son to die on the cross and when God dug that tomb to bury his body, God was in fact digging a well. And just like how three days later Jesus would rise up in resurrection, the living water rises up and springs up and bubbles up out of us today. So in the past, you've gone through hard things in your life. I'm sure we can all look back and think about difficult stuff that we've had to go through. Maybe right now in the present, some of you are going through hard things right here and right now. And in the future... As you go through hard seasons, please know that it is then and it is in those times that God is digging a well within you. When you're disappointed or confused, God is digging a well. When someone betrays you or you hurt, God is digging a well. When loved ones leave you, God is digging a well. When things happen that you just don't understand, God is digging a well. God is in the well digging business. 
And it is there, church, it is there that the living water will flow. Amen.